Dear students, we are ready for our final presentation with regard to mutual funds. And I promise this one won't be as long-winded and tedious and involved and complicated as the previous two presentations. Because today we're going to take a look at different fund families, some of the um, uh, attributes and uh, services of mutual funds and then we'll zero in on how to choose a mutual fund by looking at a sample mutual fund that has been around for 80 some odd years and uh, has done very well for its its uh, investors but remember it's only one of 12,000 but you got to start somewhere right and so I'm not trying to push you into this one individual mutual fund but I just want to show you how well these things have done over time and this one's you know one of the better ones out there so let's start on slide 62 with fund families now a family of funds exists when one investment company manages a group of mutual funds many years ago a company might have one made might have had one or maybe two mutual funds but then as the industry evolved and the competition got stronger and stronger and then we saw the huge explosion of different funds we wound up with these fund families and the funds in the family vary in their objectives so the cool thing about this is that you can move your money from one fund to another within the fund family almost always with no charge uh, if the fund is in a taxable account though you're going to generate a taxable transaction because the IRS doesn't consider it you know one monolithic fund, investment each mutual fund is a different investment so you're going to generate taxable transaction usually it's that's not going to be a big deal for you but it might be so you have to think you know you don't want taxes we're going to discuss this over and over again we don't want taxes to be the the tail that wags the dog but we want to be mindful of taxes now as we said we're not going to generate any commissions or fees from the fund family but there are some uh, funds that will charge you an excessive transfer fee and that that was the that was done we discussed this when we discussed the the scandals in the mutual fund industry that's done to discourage market timing and the kind of um, shenanigans that went on where somebody bought sold the fund and then bought it back immediately so sure you can do that but we're going to charge you two percent and we'll take that money and we don't keep, keep that money we turn around and give it to your fellow investors because you're basically stealing from them you're stealing pennies so we're going to steal a lot from you uh, Forbes says this and I wish I had come up with it choose a family not a fund and I really do believe that find a good family that uh, treats its customers well and uh, does, puts their, their interest ahead of the customers interest ahead of their own interests and there are they're out there uh, on the mutual fund uh, chap in the mutual fund chapter of the of, of, of the class website and in canvas there are six different companies that I think uh, four of them are excellent and the other two are pretty darn good and I'll leave you decide which ones are great but there are others I mean don't don't limit yourself but these all six of these companies have proved their metal over decades so check them out and so let's take a look at the next slide let's see if I can get this right yeah here is here are the top 10 families now you have to be careful because other sources have the top 10 families listed differently and it depends on how they they count the shares and the and the investments for example BlackRock is certainly the largest money manager in the world but with regard to their mutual funds they're second now so uh, and they've been the BlackRock has just skyrocketed and uh, 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 been doing very very well um, but by far the largest mutual fund company by just mutual funds is Vanguard the Vanguard group they're the ones who pioneered the index funds and they um, they have a very good marketing scheme they make it sound as if they're on your side and and they're not making any money they are folks they're making a ton of money don't get them wrong. but they're acting like they're they're the only ones who are who have got your back and it's not true I mean but that's okay it's marketing what are you gonna do um, they now are taking in far more money 
than, than everybody else uh, with regard to uh, the index funds. And we talked about how index funds are the fail-safe superlative, according to some people. BlackRock is a very smart company. Follow them. They're sharp. Uh, they uh, are. They got in on the uh, the index funds and ETF uh, uh, boom early on, and have skyrocketed past the traditionally the numbers two and three were Fidelity and American funds, also called the Capital Group, and but now you see they're even more. And again, on on the on the back of index funds, two venerable companies that have been around for decades, Fidelity and American funds, round out the third and the fourth slot. And you'll notice that they're very similar. It depends on you know what month or week or day it is who's who's more. But they're both very good companies that have been around forever. State Street Global Advisors is a very interesting company in that they started out as a company that serviced mutual funds. And they still do that. They still do that. They still, if you want to start a mutual fund, they'll do much of the tasks because they already have the, the apparatus that you can plug into uh, for you. So you don't have to create your own distributor. You don't have to create your own uh, trustee, your own uh, transfer agent. And, um, and so... They you know, built that business, and then they got involved in the ETFs, the index funds, and again, have index funds have exploded, ETFs have exploded, so they've rocketed to number five. Now, a company that's been around for a very long time that is worth your um, looking into is T. Rowe Price. Uh, they, they were one of the first mutual funds that started investing. They weren't the only one, but they were one of the first mutual funds that started investing overseas, outside the United States. They're based in Baltimore, I think, in Baltimore. And a uh, very good company. Check out. There are links on the class website and in Canvas to T. Rowe Price. Invesco is an interesting firm that uh, recently bought uh, Oppenheimer, a, a, a very um, storied and uh, a, mutual, a mutual fund company that's been around for decades. And so Invesco, their combined uh, benefits, um, benefits, assets, have put them in number seven. So check them out. Number eight, Dimensional Fund Advisors, is a relatively new uh, fund company that has become very popular with uh, advisors, financial advisors, because they have some really dynamite funds and they make it easy for advisors, financial advisors, to use their dimensional fund advisors for their clients. So check out dimensional fund advisors. PIMCO, Pacific Investment Company, they're based actually up in Newport Beach, if you can believe that. And they had the honor of having the world's largest mutual fund for several years. It was called the uh, Total Return Bond Fund, run by a very um, uh, controversial and uh, outspoken gentleman, uh, now, what's his name? Bill Gross, right? <laughs> Bill Gross. He's left PIMCO. He's, he's with another company now. I think he's with Invesco, right? No, who is he with? I forget. Or Janet? I forget. But check out, he has his own website. And he, you know, he was, um, usually money managers try to stay out of politics. But in when the run up to the uh, Iraq invasion in 2003, he was adamantly opposed to that. And of course, he got a lot of flack from his from other people on Wall Street who are saying, what are you, you got a gip stand behind the president. And he said, no, this is going to be a disaster. And he was right. So um, so check out Mr. Bill Gross. And then another very old, storied, uh, well-run company called Franklin Templeton. Um, they started out as Franklin. They merged with Templeton, Temple, John Templeton. We'll discuss Sir John Templeton in, later on. They, they also bought Mutual Shares, which were another very good company. So they've got some great funds. But recently they've run on run into a little bit of problems uh, with just people just saying we don't want to be with active managers anymore. And so Franklin Templeton has had to um, adapt. They're based in California up in San Mateo, I think it is, up in the Bay Area. But they're a very good company. Oh, by the way, Grant Vanguard is based in outside Philadelphia in King of Prussia, Malvern. I don't know if you don't know the area I do because I grew up around there. Uh, BlackRock, I think, is New York-based. Fidelity is Boston. American is uh, – Capital Group is Los Angeles. State Street's Boston. I said T. Rowe Price, Baltimore. So you can see they're all over the place, and it doesn't cost much to start up a mutual fund company, but to be one of the big boys and girls from decades ago, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a very rare um, – 
uh, thing indeed. So check out these companies. In the face-to-face -face class, we would now uh, take a look at the offerings from these companies. And I don't know how really how to do it because it's gotten so huge. It's, it's, it's impossible to take a look at. Uh, on the website and in Canvas, there are links to the offerings from these companies. And you'll see Fidelity has over 500 funds. And then they're very smart marketing folks, folks. They will sell you other people's funds. And they have over 10,000 funds available for because they sell other people's funds on you know, their behalf and they take a bit of the uh, cut, very little. And uh, that's how they make their money. Very smart. Uh, Vanguard has over 200 or so. so. So check out the offerings from these and other mutual fund companies, maybe the fund companies in your 401k, 403b. Well, you should know those, right? You should understand and know those. And of course, if you have any that you have questions about, you know, contact me. I'll tell you, I think, oh, that's a great fund. Oh, I don't know nothing about that fund or I'd stay away from that fund. And then we could do a little bit more research on behalf. All right, cool. Slide 64. Let's take a look at some of the services and the... Uh, the, uh, the things that they do for you, the mutual fund companies. Because as we said, the PETA factor is very low at, when it comes to mutual funds. The pain in the, mm -hmm, pain, yeah, right. Uh, automatic investment plans. This, my humble opinion, my, in my humble opinion, folks, this is the absolute best way to invest in a mutual fund. You don't worry about whether or not it's a good time to invest. You simply put your 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month out of your paycheck, out of your checking account, and for the vast majority of us working grunts, it's practically the only way people will invest, right? You're going to send a fixed amount of money from your paycheck, from your checking account, into your fund. There's a name for this. It's called dollar cost averaging. It is not a very good name, but I have racked my brain trying to come up with something better. Uh, but that's what it's called, and I'm going to ask you to remember that, and we're going to come back to it over and over again because it is practically the only way we work in grunts. You, you have $10,000 lying around the house? Neither do I, right? Pay yourself first, right? Pay yourself first. And so every month before you pay the rent, before you pay the uh, the, um, the 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 cell phones and the, the, whatever, the trash or whatever, when it comes out of your paycheck, folks, it's so easy. Why? Because you don't even get to you don't get a chance. Or in the case of um, your Roth IRA, my Roth, our, my wife and I Roth IRA, we get I get paid at the end of every month. Two days later, on the second of the, the month, boom goes the, uh, the, uh, the the Roth IRA contribution. Cool. That I, that's the way, folks. Because then you pay yourself first, you dollar cost average, you sometimes buy shares when they're high, sometimes buy shares when they're low, but low, but who cares? And on, in the Canvas and in the uh, website, there's a, uh, um, a pre little presentation about somebody who, well, they had $10,000. They didn't worry about when the best time, when the worst time is. They wound up picking the best time or the worst time. And you'd think that the person who picked the best time would do a whole lot better than the person who picked the worst time. And it turns out, no, they did They did better. They didn't do a whole lot better. And so that's the moral, is to just pay yourself first. If it's for the long term, if this is for your retirement account, uh, uh, whatever, uh, uh, for something you're not going to touch for 5, 10, 15 years, then yeah. If it's a short term, where do we need to put? You know where we need to put the money in your savings account, in your money market, CDs, right. Slide 65. Now, we don't really even need this slide because by default, your mutual fund company is going to automatically reinvest any uh, capital gains, dividends, interest with additional shares. This is the service that enables shareholders to automatically buy additional shares in the fund through reinvestment of dividends, interest, and capital gains. This allows an investor to earn fully compounded rates of return. Unless you need the income, it is always a good idea to reinvest dividends and capital gains received from a mutual fund. By the way, as we said, automatic reinvestment of dividends, interest, and capital gains is the default unless you choose otherwise. If you choose otherwise, say, look, send me the money. They'll first of all ask you to 
to uh, set up automatic deposit, right? Automatic withdrawal, so they don't have to send you a check. But it, but they'll they'll uh, send you a check or send you the money electronically every month, every quarter, every year, whenever they distribute any dividends, interest, capital gains. In other words, the rewards from investing. But normally, they want you to reinvest them, and that makes perfect sense. Slide 66, how do we take the money out? Well, again, systematically, a systematic withdrawal plan is the mutual fund service that enables shareholders to automatically receive a predetermined amount of money monthly, quarterly, annually. Normally, they're going to want you. Again, they don't want to send a check because it costs them you know, five, six bucks, whereas electronic is cents, you know, maybe two cents. Uh, electronically, they want to transfer this directly to your checking account. And so here's the deal. Here's the deal, folks. You're going to put 50 bucks, 100 bucks more as you can afford it. Try to raise it $10 every year, $5 every year. You're going to do that for 30, 40 years while you're working. 50, you younger folks, you're going to be working into your 70s because you're going to be living into your hundreds. And then for the rest of your life, you're going to take one, two, three thousand dollars a month out of your mutual fund for the rest of your life. Is that a deal? I hope you do it. I hope you do it because that's what kind of wealth we can build, as you'll see when we take a look at the hypothetical illustrations. Now, the conversion privilege, the exchange privilege, we already talked about this. It allows shareholders to move money from one fund to another within the same fund family without any penalty without any extra fees, but if it's in a, a regular taxable account, what the IRS calls non-qualified account, then you're going to have to uh, pay the taxes. Or maybe if you had a loss, you'd get a tax break. But if it's in a qualified, tax-qualified account, that's what the term the IRS uses, then a retirement account, educational savings account, and the like, health savings account, then you don't pay any taxes. You wait, you wait until you take the money out. And if it's in a Roth and you wait until you're retired, you don't pay any tax. That's, we'll talk about that. And Business 121 talks about Roth IRA, so everybody should have a Roth IRA. By the way, we're not allowed to say that as brokers because everyone's different, but everyone should have a Roth IRA. Slide number, let them sue me, 67. How do we buy our mutual funds? Well, as we said, if we buy a closed end or an ETF, we buy it through the stock exchange, through our brokerage accounts. But the smart... Mutual funds like Vanguard, Fidelity, you can buy their ETFs through the stock exchange and pay no commissions because they have their own brokerage companies, which have the same name, but they're different companies. The open-end funds you buy through the broker, directly from the investment company, and in my humble opinion, the best way is through automatic contributions. When you sell it, if you have a closed-end ETF through your brokerage firm, open-end through your broker or through the mutual fund, again, the best way, in my humble opinion, is automatic withdrawals. Now, obviously, if you've been saving up for a down payment on a house, you know you're gonna you're not gonna <laughs> you're gonna say, "Give me the twenty five thousand dollars or whatever it is, I need it now to to make my down payment or maybe kids' education." Even then, you're still not gonna want to take it all out in one lump sum. The, you know, you're going to take it out over the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve years that they're in college. <laughs> Slide. <laughs> 68 tax oh man why do we got to talk about taxes well you know taxes are important they're not the most important thing in my humble opinion as we said we should not allow taxes to be the tail that wags the dog but um but still they're important to think about and uh there are two types of taxes for regular accounts there's the taxes on dividends and interest where it's typically taxed as income, although dividends, qualified dividends, and we're not going to get into all the tax ramifications, take accounting 109 if you want to learn about the difference between qualified and non-qualified dividends, typically are lower than if we earn the money. This is very good for wealthy people. And the same thing is true for capital gains distributions. We get taxed at a lower level than when you make money as a an employee. And why do you think that is? I'll let you figure that out. Poly means many and ticks are blood-sucking insects. Now, uh, reinvested dividends and capital gains are still taxable transactions. So this is the dynamic. The market might have fallen in one year, but at the end of the year, the, 
the person they see that their you know their ten thousand dollars is now eight thousand dollars, but they still get a ten ninety nine that says you owe so much money in taxes because you made so much money. What do you mean I made money? I lost money. Well, no, the fund distributed some earnings in the form of dividends, interest, capital gains. The value of the fund fell, but still you received those as reinvested uh, uh, shares. And so the IRS says you got to pay taxes on them. And so people go to their Congress bows, I mean, congressperson and yell and scream and holler and say, this is not right. And so every once in a while, the congressman will say, well, we got to do something about this. You know, unrealized capital gains should not be taxed until you sell your mutual funds. Forget it. It ain't going to happen because it would be an accounting nightmare. If they do it, they deserve to have their their hands slapped, their their their, their bellies uh, Noogie, they they they, they, they oh, don't do it, you know. And I'm not an accountant, folks, I, you know. But uh, but it would really be a nightmare if they tried to pull this off. So don't get upset if you sometimes see your value fall, but you still get a 10.99 saying you owe. It won't be much to start off with. It will be you know ten dollars if at most you pay in taxes or twenty bucks. When it becomes a serious amount of money, congratulations. In other words, when you're paying a lot of taxes. It'll be on your earnings from your mutual funds. You've done well. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, I hope all of my students have that serious, horrible problem in their later years when they have tremendous sums of money that they're paying taxes on. I can tell you lots of stories about this. One of them is actually actually very good. A gentleman I ride bikes with and his wife, um, he always is screaming and hollering about how many taxes he has to pay because he's done very well for himself. And he kept asking me, how can you get not pay this? How can you not pay that? I said, finally, finally, I, I got sick of it. I said, you know, I know a way that you don't have to pay any taxes on your capital gains and get a tax break. He goes, how do I do it? How do I do it? I said, you donate that those shares to Julian's Anchorage Battered Women's Shelter. Okay, <laughs> 503C IRS approved uh, uh, charity and you will get a tax break twice. You get to deduct the amount of the, the, the shares as a taxable, as a, not, as a deduction and you don't have to pay the capital gains on them. And his wife said, that's right. I don't want to hear anything else from you. Quit your Grexon. We are very blessed. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. anyway. What happens if their money's in a tax deferred, tax qualified, a retirement account, a 401k, a 403b, or a health savings account? Well, then it depends on what type. Is it pre-tax or post-tax? You don't pay any taxes until retirement on the pre-tax, and then the proceeds are taxed as income. If it has a Roth a provision, which means it's post-tax, and it's named after a guy, William Roth, who came up with the idea back in the late 90s. Um, then you don't pay any taxes. Very cool. Roth IRAs are very cool. And there are these Roth so-called provisions in 401ks and 403bs, which the IRS doesn't use the term Roth. They just say after tax. So think about it. If you don't need the tax break now, you could put the money into your 401k, 403b, put it in a Roth IRA, and you'll get it Big tax break later, and I'm a big fan of Roth IRAs. Okay, now, where do we get the information? Oh, boy. Sip from the fire hose. This is part of your assignment, is to go research a couple or more mutual funds, look at the annual reports, look at the prospectuses. This, the prospectus is a very important document that nobody reads. It is actually very useful. If you have insomnia... You bring it to your bed with you, and very quickly you will be. F okay, slide 69. What's the mutual fund prospectus? A statement describing the risk factors, descriptions of the fund's past performance, the, the types of investments in the fund's portfolio, the strategies involved, information about dividends, distributions, taxes, information about the fund's management. Nobody reads them unless they take. Business 123, in which case I heartily, uh, strongly advise that you do read them. It's not that hard until it gets to near the end, and then it's all numbers and stuff that, that only the accountants read. 
But the, the stuff in the beginning is so important about what are the fund's objectives, what are the risks involved, you know, how well did they do, what are the fees, the fees, the fees as required by the business, I mean, the uh, Investment Company Act of 1940. And then the mutual fund annual report. Some of these are extremely well written, chock full of good information. Others are, you know, open opaque they're just impossible to read and it's by design they don't want you to know how badly they've done vis-a-vis -vis their their competitors so they do their best to obfuscate you like that word obfuscate it means make it really difficult to read the information so check it out that's part of your assignment is to take a look at a couple of annual reports the prospectuses read everything you can through morningstar lipper and other um, uh, websites and and and, and um, you can go to library. Libraries are cool uh, sources. Okay, so where are the sources? Uh, we were just discussing those on slide seventy. Morningstar, Lipper, they're the two big one big companies that that um, um, rate and review mutual funds. Now Morningstar is going to try to sign you up for premium services. You know, just keep saying thank you very much. No, thank you, because you can go to the library. Lipper used to not give you any information online. You had to sign up immediately um, and you would have to go to the library. But now they've been purchased by Reuters, I think it is. And so they give you more information online. So check them out. Then Business Week, Forbes, Kiplinger's, Money, all the mute, all the, uh, the financial magazines and the like, Barron's. The surveys usually include the overall rating compared to other funds, the funds in the same category. That's the one that I like to see. How have they done according to their uh, funds in the same category? The sales charges, the fund size, the expense ratio, the turnover rate, loss factors, risk, toll-free numbers. And they only show you three, five, and 10 years. That's not good enough for me. I want to see 20. I want to see 40 years. I want to see decades. How well have their they done for decades, which, of course, you know, if anybody knew, that sort of leaves them out in the cold, right? They've only been around, and uh, I wish them well, but uh, I want a company that's been around for a long time. But that's me. That's me. You decide. But that's what you're going to do. You're going to do the research necessary to make informed, prudent, long-term investment decisions and be awesome. Sounds like an advertisement. Anyway, slide 71. The mutual fund websites have actually really done well. At first, in the late 90s, when the internet was really big and wonderful, uh, and, and everybody was coming out with these great websites. Vanguard's was awesome. T. Road Prices was awesome. But then in the 2000 to 2000 bear market, they all shut down all their education programs. And I don't know what happened, but I assume the Securities and Exchange Commission said, look, you, you're you not a an AOL or a Yahoo or a, or whatever the, well, now we have, you know, Google, but before them, uh, you're not a, a internet website. Your, your internet is just to contact and just, you know, do business with your, with your um, shareholders. But then I guess they lightened up because now some of them have great information. Uh, American funds, which is now called Capital Group, Capital Group, uh, Franklin Templeton, Dodge and Cox. What a great group. Check out Dodge and Cox. And they have, you know, insights and uh, market heads, year behind, year ahead look, overviews. And they tell you what they think is going on. So check them out. Uh, Finance.yahoo.com, you know, we're, we're going to use it because it's still useful. But, boy, it's bad. It, it just, just did their best to destroy it. And you'll play with Morningstar, but be careful because they're going to try to sign you up. Of course, the mother load, for those of you who are into sadistics, is ICI.org, the in Investment Company Institute, which is a trade uh, group that is uh, funded by the mutual fund companies, but it's nonprofit. It's, it, it, they have statisticians and economists working there, but they don't, they don't, they don't do their own investments. They, they're just a trade group representative for the investment company industry. And it, that fact book is, is awesome, folks. You might find it very dry, and it is by de by design, but it really tells you a lot about the industry, and I love reading through it every year. Slide number 72. Ah, are you overwhelmed yet? 
It's overwhelming. That's the problem with mutual funds, going into the store and seeing 12,000 different types of breakfast cereals. What's a person to do? Well, how do I pick a mutual fund, Piano? <laughs> it ain't easy. I'm not going to tell you it is. But here's my advice for what it's worth. Pick a mutual fund that invests in high quality stocks or bonds. There's that term, quality. And it's hard to describe, right? Quality is often in the eyes of the beholder. But you know it when you see it. You know companies that, yeah, that's a bona fide, that's a real company. And then you know about these others like, oh, yeah, are they going to be around in three or five years? Maybe, who knows? Maybe not. Is well diversified across several industries and sectors of the economy. So right across the bat, you, I don't like those sector funds that just invest in one sector of the economy. Has a long-term perspective and a manager, or better yet, a team with many years of experience. Not a committee, a team where they all work together, but they make their own decisions. Those I find to be my favorite mutual funds and my certainly favorite strategy for mutual fund managers. You want to avoid companies that shuffle their managers every few years like a deck of cards. And I say which is virtually all of them, and it's not true anymore. I should really take that out. In fact, I better, I better make, make a note to myself. Many of the companies have realized that this is the wrong way to do. This is what Fidelity was famous for. They would get some new hotshot out of some you know Ivy League school who just some whiz whiz bang you know genius, and say, okay, kid, here's a billion dollars, go at it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> is that? A, I don't think it's a good way. You know, uh, some of these companies that have been around for decades now, what they do is they start them off slowly. They give them a little bit of money and have them just look at one sector or a research analyst of one sector, one automotive, or they look at a wireless, or they look at a leisure, or the, or the movie industry. And they start them slowly working their way up to where they're managing a billion dollars. And that, to me, is the, uh, my, my favorite strategy. But you decide. Because there are some pretty darn hot managers out there, which we'll take a look at in just a few slides. And has been around and... and for decades, oops, 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 I, I goofed there. Let's go back. Come on, I, I, I'm getting me in technology. What's, now, why aren't you going backwards? Why isn't it going backwards? It's not going backwards. There it goes. Has been around for decades and performed consistently well in both good and bad markets. Look, folks, don't tell me how well you've done in a good market. I ain't interested. Any idiot, yours, yours truly included, can do well when the market's doing well. It's how well you do when the organic matter hit the, hits the ventilating device. That's how, that's what I want to know. I want to know how well you did when the markets fall. Because they're going to, you know, that's what history tells us. Maybe not. Maybe they go up forever and ever and ever and oh man, I don't believe it. So I want to see how well you did when the markets fall, fell badly. That's what I want to see. So here, finally, on slide 73 is where we, in the face-to-face -face class now, we'll jump to some of the things, uh, the ancillary uh, um, accompanying presentations, you know, worst day, best, best day, uh, the benefit of time and the like, and the, uh, the illustration for 80-some 80, you know, 80 years of investing. So here's a sample mutual fund that's been around since 1934, actually December 31st, 1933, but actually it's been around before that. That's when the they got bought by somebody else. And it's not done 8, 9, 10%, folks. It's done 12%. Remember, we tell people 8, 9, 10%. But these people have done 12% for almost 90 years. You'll hear people say stocks are very risky. But they're right in the short term, but not in the long term. As we see when, with this guy, you look at the, uh, the, uh, the many years of investing and then look at how well they've done over time, th one year, three years, five years, ten years. If you have a long-term perspective, you've done well. And you'll hear people say, well, now is not a good time to invest. Excuse me, when is it ever a good time to invest? When do you ever feel like it's a good time to invest? After the stock market has gone up two, three hundred percent. That's when people say, oh, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? 
Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, when's the best time to invest? When the markets drop 30, 40, 50 percent. Ooh, is it too late to get out? <laughs> Yeah, now's the time when you should be buying. So one of the uh, presentations is how well you had done if you invested on the worst day, how well you would have done if you invested on the best day. And it turns out that you you know, you did pretty good in both of them. You did better if you picked the best day, and you did worse if you picked the worst, but you still did pretty darn good. And are you going to pick the best day? Are you going to pick the worst day? No, you're going to put 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month away. What about market downturns? Again, keep a long-term perspective, and there's that term that we haven't come up with. A, if anybody comes up with a better term, please contact me. Dollar cost average. Come on, sweetheart, go to the... There it is. Dollar cost averaging. A system of buying an investment at regular intervals with a fixed dollar amount. Uh, that's actually kind of a silly way to, to uh, describe it. You'd say it's 50 bucks a month. You just start investing 50 bucks a month. And the cool thing about this, and I, I use this psychology on my wife many years ago because when we first met, she was terrified of stocks. There's always good news. When you wake up in the morning, there's good news. No matter what, right? The market's up. Good news! Your account is worth more. Yeah, your $100 is now $100.25. Okay. The market's down. Good news! What? No, yes! When do you want to buy something? When it's on sale. Next month, when you will get more shares at a lower price when the $50, $100 a month comes out of your paycheck or checking account. You understand? Sometimes you're going to be buying high, you're going to be buying fewer shares. Sometimes you're going to be buying low, you're going to be buying more shares. Yeah. And the truism, which is not a guarantee, but your average cost per share should be lower than your average price per share. And I wish you'll memorize that. I'm going to ask you to memorize it later on in the semester, but now try to remember it. And it doesn't make sense until you actually do some numbers. In other words, you're going to be buying more shares when the price is low so your average cost should be less than your average price it's not a guarantee if you buy a stinker of an investment and keep dollar cost averaging oh great i'm getting more shares as as the price falls and falls and falls <laughs> not so good you know but 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 if you buy a bona fide investment that does well over the long term prudent it, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a strong strategy that have been has been used by millions of people and it's certainly the one I recommend and I used for decades now because I'm old. Okay, so <clears throat> in the face-to-face -face classes, now when we would jump over and take a look at these hypothetical illustrations, the one for the company since its inception in 1934, and then what happens if we put $100 a month for 30 years, $100 a month for 40 years, it's that extra 10 years, folks. That's why we want to get you started in your 20s or even in your 30s. 25 is that magic number. If you can get started age 25, ooh, and some of you are going to get started earlier, especially if you're in the military or something like that. Uh, we can give these hypothetical illustrations. They're examples of returns of investments for either a lump sum or a stream of investment, a systematic investment, or dollar cost average. There's, there's one that actually I thought was actually not bad, a systematic investment program. But that sounds so clinical. Uh, or a combination of both. Now, they must be approved by the regulators, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the FINRA, Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, and dis contain disclaimers about past versus future performance. The past returns are not guarantees of future performance. You may lose money. You will lose money. There's going to be times. If you invest in stocks, there's going to be times when you lose money. So take a look at these. Take a look at the when we do it in the face-to-face -face class. So you can jump on over now or wait until, because we're almost done. We're almost done. We're almost done. <laughs> Slide 76. But as I said, I'm not just trying to sell you the investment company of America, folks. There are a couple of dozen funds that have been around for over 50 years and every single one of them has done to better than 10 percent now there's one uh, exception to that and that's the franklin utilities fund but folks i put that in there because i am in awe of these people since 1948 franklin utility fund has returned almost 10 percent if you get five six percent from a utilities fund 
you should be very thankful because utilities are utilities. They ain't going anywhere and people are not going to want to take cold showers in the dark. So you're going to get paid. Now, you're not going to get paid the same as if you bought into the latest new technology and exploded and the like. But how did they do 9.8%? I don't know, that, but congratulations. But look this, 11 and a half since 1967. 11 and a half, 1950. Dodge and Cox. What a great company. They're really quiet. They they have, what, five, six funds based in San Francisco. But they, since 1931, have done 10%. And then Fidelity. Look, Contra Fund. There's a, there is a, there's a fund you ought to look up, folks. Contra Fund, because he's still around. His name is Will Danoff? No. Yeah, Will Danoff, right? No, I'm getting it wrong. Yeah, Will Danoff. And he's a, he's brilliant. I love listening to him. Whatever you can go on YouTube or or find him talking, he's he's really sharp. Look at that twelve and a half. And then I agonize whether I should put Fidelity Magellan in there, because folks, fifteen point. It's just no, 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 no. It's just not gonna continue. And why is that? Because it's skewed by the twelve years that Peter Lynch ran Fidelity Magellan, where he racked up 29% a year, 1977 to 1989. So Fidelity Magellan, we really shouldn't tell, we really shouldn't show people that because your eyes are going to go, ooh, can I get really 15 and eight? No, no, it's not going to happen. So it hasn't returned to its former glory, but it's still been around for over 50 years, so it makes the cut. Uh, there's the, some Franklin funds, very good fund, Franklin Mutual shares, and then also the Templeton Growth Fund, 1954, uh, is part of Franklin now. Here's uh, the Investment Company of America, the one, the, the one we just took a look at, the sample fund. MFS, the nation's law, oldest mutual fund company based in Boston, Massachusetts Financial Services, I think they're called. MFS, they've been around the longest. They have a fund that goes back to 1924, I think the Pioneer Fund. And then we talked about T. Rowe Price, very good company, T. Rowe Price, look at that, 13%, you know, ignore the 15.87 of Magellan, but this is a real, this company's been around since 1956 and they didn't have some hot shot who skewed the numbers up because of a great 12 year run. No, this guy is awesome. The Dreyfus Fund, Mr. Dreyfus is long gone and now it's owned by Mellon, BN, Bank of New York Mellon. And then there's a Vanguard fund. Windsor been around forever. And then there's another American funds, Washington Mutual. Oh, by the way, AMCAP, American Mutual Fund, Investment Company of America, Washington Mutual Investors Fund, they're all American funds now called the Capital Group. Well, they've always been called the Cap. They're a real strange group. They're based in L.A. They've always been called the Capital Group, but everybody else referred to them as American funds. And now they're saying, we're the Capital Group. And why are they doing that? Because they want to go globally. They want to offer their mutual funds outside the United States and they don't want it to be just called the American funds. People think, oh, it's just for Americans. So good luck to them for that <laughs> because changing people's perceptions is sometimes hard. I still call them the American funds. And um, and I'm a big fan of them, by the way. They're, they're a really well-run group. And all these companies are really well-run, so they all deserve your attention. So that's not the only one. And by the way, I would really recommend none of these None of these, and maybe the Templeton Growth Fund, but I'd recommend none of these to somebody just starting out in their early 20s. Why? Because they're all mostly domestic. And that's not bad. It's just that when they started over 50 years ago, there just weren't that many people who invested outside the United States. It just wasn't done. And it wasn't until the 1970s, 80s that companies started coming around to investing outside the United States. So personally, I recommend to most individuals who are younger a global growth and income stock mutual fund. Because as I said, I'll say it again, I want my mutual fund managers to go find the best company no matter where it happens to be based. And that's my, you know, as I said, other people disagree, stay with the United States, tried and true. But that, that, so, so I'm not trying to sell you any of these individual mutual funds. I'm just trying to show you that they're out there. And anybody who tells you that you can't beat the index over time is obviously wrong because here's the proof. And we'll come back to this idea. People say, well, they're just lucky. 
Excuse me? <laughs> Lucky? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> sure. That's like saying somebody who can dunk a basketball two at a time is lucky, or somebody who can hit a fastball at 98 miles is lucky. You're lucky if you can stay in the box <laughs> instead of like me and running out of the box when that ball comes at you at almost 100 miles an hour, or sing a four hour opera. You see, it ain't easy, but some people can do it. And the same thing is true with money management. And maybe you're going to be one of them. I certainly hope so. And the cool thing is you don't have to be one of them. To do well, you don't have to be as awesome as these people are. There's room for you to make money as your own financial advisor. But maybe you say, you know what? I don't really want to do that. I like mutual funds. Or they're in your 401k and you have no other choice. Slide 77. We're almost done, folks. I promise. But what about the investors? What types of returns do many typical mutual fund investors earn? Not so good. Well, wait a minute. The saying is most mutual fund investors do worse than the mutual funds they invest in. Now, how can that be? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You are investing in a mutual fund. You would do as well as the mutual fund, right? Wrong. What happens? Ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Right, when the market skyrockets. And so that's exactly what they do. They shower their mutual fund managers with love and attention and money. And then when the market tanks, what happens? Ooh, 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 is it too late to get out? And they pull their money out at the worst possible time. So let's see if we can follow this chart here. This is 2000, the height of the market in the late 1990s when the market went up in two directions, went, went in two directions up and way up. And look at this blue number is the inflows and the yellow number is the, is the how well the market did. So you see people were dumping tons of money into mutual funds in 2000 just as the market started crashing. And then they started pulling the money out in 2001, just as the market recovered, only, I mean, so 2003, they started punning, pulling money out in 2003, only to see the market come back, and then they followed, dumped, put the money back in the market until 2008, and then when the market tanked, they pulled their money out. Do you see what people are doing? They are not buying low, selling high, they are buying high and selling low. And then look, they did not start putting money back in. Oh, come on. Why isn't this working? Come on. Oh, well, it's not going to work for me, but there it goes. They didn't start putting money back in until 2013, 14. They were pulling money out throughout the Great Recession, even after the recession had ended. And the market was, you know, doing okay. It fell a little bit. Not never, never a 20% bear market decline. So you see, we're not rational. We're ruled by our emotions. And that's why Warren Buffett says investing is simple, but it ain't easy. So you have to be emotionally prepared for these times and remind yourself that, look, I'm going to be buying more shares the next month when my 25, 50 bucks a month comes out of my paycheck or checking account. Or if you got a little bit extra cash, it's time to put more money in. You see, don't be one of the mutual fund managers that does worse than their mutual funds. Slide 78. What's the bottom line? Choose a fund family, stick with them, reevaluate them periodic periodically, once or twice a year is enough, folks. But make changes judiciously and sparingly. You like that word, judiciously? As you approach retirement, migrate from stock funds to bond funds, but don't give up on stocks entirely. We'll come back to this idea later on. Stocks in retirement, yeah. Dollar cost average, 50 bucks, 100 hours a month, more if you can afford it, but for the most part, forget about them. <laughs> Do not be one of the mutual fund investors that does worse than your mutual funds. Okay? I hope so. And if you... Get the feeling like you want to jump off the ledge. Call me up and I'll give you my talk them off the ledge talk. 
We've been here before. History tells us that these are the best times to invest, but while we're in them, they're not fun. They make you feel horrible, but that's how invest. That's what comes with investing in stocks. So slide 79. Whoo, whoo. I want to congratulate you on making it this far. Go back over, listen to these again while you're exercising, while you're walking the dog, commuting. Inculcate yourself. Isn't that a great word? It means immerse yourself in these so that you are the investment expert, certainly with regard to the mutual funds that are in your 401k, 403b, helping your folks and your friends and family and coworkers. And they will be so in awe of you as I am. Keep up the great work. Don't give up. Never give up. We are very proud of you, dear students. And we are ready to start our journey into the world of stocks. So we'll see you again in Chapter 5, Introduction to Stocks.